My name is Tom Labatthal, and we'll be working through this afternoon with a fine panel of speakers. Uh, I believe um, uh, Sue Ann Taylor was going to do an introduction and a video uh, for our first speaker, Jessica Mattmuller. Tom, I, I would like to set up Jess and Mike's video quickly. It's going to get dropped in, and then we're going to put the AFLCI slide at the end of this. Jess. Very good. Jess's 11th anniversary is today and Mike should be here. And if people had followed prevention and regulatory action, Mike might've been here today. He had secondary exposure. Hello, my name is Jessica Matt Mueller. <clears throat> I am the wife of the late Mike Matt Mueller who passed away from mesothelioma, unfortunately last year in April at the start of the pandemic. Um, Mike was a almost nine year mesothelioma survivor. Um, he had his lung removed in 2012 and, you know, battled this horrible disease that could have easily been prevented. Um, as we all know, it was, well, no, not as we all know, a lot of people don't know, but it was very popular back, you know, in the early days used as you know in a lot of products um and a lot of people think it is banned that we, nobody uses it anymore um and that's just not the case it's not used as much but it's still being imported into the united states and i wasn't aware of that 10 years ago i had just started my marriage i was you know, I was ha pretty happy and carefree, and then wham, you know, you're slapped with the diagnosis that, you know, it wasn't anything that you did with your diet or anything that you did wrong. It was something that happened way in your past that, you know, you just unfortunately inhaled some fibers, and now my five-year-old daughter has no father because of that. <laughs> all because of something that was, you know, mined out of the ground and sent to us and used in products and inhaled and, you know, it's, it's, it's just not fair in my eyes for my daughter to go without a father when this is something that could have definitely been prevented. Um, and there's some people that are doing housework and they're moving into you know, new homes. I know that the, the housing market is booming right now and that's scary, you know, a lot of people are gobbling up old homes and renovating them and they're not aware that that tile on the floor is asbestos and you rip it up and by then it's too late. Um, we need to have more knowledge, even at a young age, I think in schools, teaching our kids about it. Um, but, what you can do is call your local congressman and make them aware that it's something that's that's not needed anymore. There's so many other substitutions that are better and are just fine. And I really wish that greed wasn't, you know, their top priority, unfortunately, in my eyes. But I really hope for my daughter's sake, I'm going to keep fighting. I know that's what Mike would have wanted. He fought until the very end to get this, this stuff banned. Um, so we'll get there with Linda, with your help and the, all the hard work that you continue to do. I know that we will get there. Um, but yeah, it's still in a lot of old homes and people just need to understand um, the different websites you can visit to learn about it. Um, and just spreading the word, word of mouth. And um, I just worry about my daughter and keeping her safe. So I'm gonna keep doing my part to, like I said, spread the word and get this stuff banned because it's something that could have been easily prevented. And Mike could still be here and he's not. So that's not okay. But thank you for listening to me and Stay, stay healthy, guys. <laughs>
My name is Tom Labathal, and we'll be working through this afternoon with a fine panel of speakers. So let me introduce our first speaker then uh, for this group, and it will be uh, Kelly Troutner, and she's with the American Federation of Teachers. Uh, Kelly Troutner is a trade unionist who believes in communities are safest when frontline workers have a seat at the table where decisions are made, advocating for themselves and for the people that they serve. An essential precept of the director of the American Federation of Teachers Health Program. She's been honored for her contributions to the labor movement in her state and received the Ohio Nurses Association inaugural solidarity award, creating in her name. Kelly holds a Juris Doctor from Capital University Law School and is a licensed attorney. Kelly, join us and thank you so much. Thanks, Tom, and thanks to all of you who are tuning in today for this conference. Um, as Tom mentioned, um, I've been a trade unionist for many, many years, and in my current role, I'm the Senior Director for Health Issues with the American Federation of Teachers. And what that means is my program responsibilities um, include our Occupational Safety and Health Program. Um, I also direct our healthcare um, division, which is comprised of about 200,000 healthcare workers who work in every setting where healthcare is delivered. But what I want to talk to you about today is uh, very school focused. Um, and we have done at the AFT a lot of work around asbestos advocacy um, throughout the years. We, of course, do a lot of legislative work with organizations like ADAO. Um, we also are doing a lot of work right now around school infrastructure. We have a green school buildings initiative that we're um, launching. And um, before I go any further, I just want to reiterate and underscore the um, announcement that Re Rebecca made and really encourage all of you to take part in the AFL-CIO's action that was announced earlier. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, some of the work that AFT has done in schools related to asbestos. Um, I want to, I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly because I want to share some examples of some of the work that we've done. So the US EPA estimates that there are asbestos containing materials in most of the nation's primary, secondary, and charter schools. And that's because uh, half of all the schools in the US were built between the years of 1950 and 1969 which was a time when asbestos was added to virtually every kind of building material to increase durability and fire resistance. And in this picture, you see um, the president of one of our affiliates, um, the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers. Uh, and I'll share a little bit of information shortly with um, respect to some of the work that we've done there. So to protect members from the hazards associated with asbestos exposure, uh, exposure um, some of the work that we've done um, through union perseverance and pressure, um, we have worked to pressure Congress, um, and that has panned out. And of course, certainly we're not the only organization, but um, we do believe that we've played a role in persuading Congress to expand um, AHERA in 1987, and also we've fought um, for really strict OSHA standards for any worker who is involved in asbestos removal in schools and other buildings or, um, or work, um, any work activity that brings him or her into contact with asbestos. These regulations are especially important for our school maintenance and custodial workers. Um, these workers can encounter these potentially um, asbestos containing materials while performing even like the most routine tasks in their work, such as cleaning, uh, wiring and pipe and boiler repair. But the hazards of asbestos go beyond exposure for these workers to school staff and students who are just working and learning in these spaces. Asbestos is so dangerous and prevalent because it can lurk behind the walls, above the ceilings, and under the floors in older schools all across the country. And much of this material we know is now deteriorating and can be easily damaged during whether it's negligent maintenance work or improper abatement procedures, which can expose an entire school population to these hazards. And in this picture is our president, Randy Weingarten, and again, Jerry, um, our president from Philadelphia. So what has been AFT's response? 
Um, our health and safety team has conducted hundreds, literally hundreds of trainings for our members across all our divisions in the union to educate them about the hazards associated with asbestos and how to protect themselves and the people that we serve from asbestos exposure. We've provided technical assistance and training for our K-12 leaders and members on how to read AHERA reports. We have participated in walkthroughs and inspections of schools and other buildings to help our leaders identify potential hazards associated with asbestos. We also have helped affiliates fight for proper implementation of AHERA and OSHA regulations. We filed numerous OSHA complaints uh, where employers have actually been cited for lacking the proper protections for our members. We've also testified before federal, federal and state tribunals to secure legislation around asbestos protections. So now I wanna go into a few examples of some of the work that we've done. So I wanna take you back to 1993. And in August of that year, the School Construction Authority or the SCA and the special commissioner for investigations sealed the offices of the New York City Board of Education's environmental and uh, health and safety group um, that was formerly known as the asbestos task force, um, alleging that hundreds of reports were falsified and thousands of other documents were missing. So this internal probe eventually widened to include probes by the EPA, um, federal prosecutors, uh, the FBI, and the Queens County District Attorney's Office. So the UFT, which is our, um, our affiliate in New York City, it's one of the largest union locals in the world, um, fought for and won a state law that will protect all of our members in the future. So if at some point they become ill and believe it to be a school asbestos related illness, our members now have the right to file a lawsuit. Fast forwarding, this is, uh, this is an ongoing issue that we're working on currently uh, in Nashua, New Hampshire. So in Nashua, the school district um, purchased a former school building. Um, the plan was to move all their preschool programs to this building. And our health and safety team uh, in our occupational safety and health program, um, we've been really working closely with the local leaders in Nashua, um, reviewing and analyzing the AHERA plan, and we've been working to, um, to train our leaders on you know, what sorts of monitoring they may do. And we've also been working with them to make recommendations going forward. And sorry for going so fast. I just, I have a lot of good stuff that I wanna share with you. So this has been um, in Scranton, PA, this has been a really, um, a really interesting um, scenario and sometimes uh, very frustrating and even heartbreaking. So the AFT has worked with our affiliate um, in Scranton, which is called the Scranton Teachers Union, um, quite extensively on addressing asbestos in their school buildings. And we have, just to, to share with you kind of a rundown of the things that we've done, we've worked with them to review the AHERA reports uh, or AHERA requirements. Um, we have demanded access to the reports and work to analyze them. Um, we've conducted leader trainings and member training, site inspections. Um, we've demanded re-inspections with union participation. Um, and eventually we've got the um, necessary action to remediate the problem areas with the building. In Scranton, this is an example of where school board um, uh, leaders and administrators really lack the expertise to really know what to do, to know what sorts of experts they should rely upon, um, and you know, and what's, you know, what sorts of experts to really spend the, the public's money on in looking at these issues. But what we know now is that the evidence points to um, three school officials hiding the presence of dangerous asbestos from the teachers, the staff, the parents, and the students for years, literally years. Um, investigators, including our health and safety staff, and we actually um, pulled in some of the health and safety staff from UFT in New York City. Um, we, um, through the investigations, uncovered asbestos in the classrooms, in restrooms, and a cafeteria. And we now know that school officials have known about this since at least 2016. So the PFT is suing the school district over its handling of asbestos lead and mold problems as well inside of its very aging school buildings. Now Philadelphia, 
So AFT president, um, Arthur uh, Steinberg, he's the, the statewide president in Pennsylvania, along with the Philadelphia um, local president, Jerry Jordan, and the director of um, environmental science for the um, PFT HW, um, joined a very critical hearing on Pennsylvania's toxic schools crisis, um, which expands beyond asbestos, but for purposes today, we'll talk about asbestos. The hearing um, was called actually by a state representative um, and a state senator and was a really, really important venue for advocating for the, the urgent resources we know that we need to ensure that our schools are free from environmental toxins. And this slide outlines some of the, the detail um, that we've been looking at there. So looking ahead, um, Asbestos has largely become a forgotten issue in the U.S., um, you know, present company excluded. Um, but the last known systemic survey of asbestos in schools across the country was done over 40 years ago by the Environmental Protection Com uh, Agency. <laughs> asbestos remains an enduring threat to the well-being of countless people, and AFT remains committed to ensuring that asbestos mitigation and protections for the workers and the students remains at the top of our agenda, and it truly does. However, one of the challenges is that federal funding sources have um, dried up to support schools' efforts to reduce the risk of exposure to asbestos. So schools now have to pay for those renovations themselves, which is very problematic if you know anything about school budgets. And what this does is this takes you know, valuable dollars away from education and even causes schools to close. So it's kind of a Hobson's choice for the people who, who live and, and learn and teach in those districts. But we know asbestos is still with us and the AFT is certainly committed to ensuring that the protections um, that we have fought for are still in place. That's the content that I have to present to you today. Certainly, if you have you know, further questions or you want additional information or if you're a, a community um, you know, representing a community group and would like to partner with us, we'd love to hear from you. So please reach out at any point in time. And I want to, I want to say thank you to Linda um, for having us at this very important conference today. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was a wonderful presentation. We appreciate it very much. Our next speaker is Simon Butt Bethlendi, and uh, he's a public relations and campaigns manager with the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health, or IOSH is a chartered PR practitioner who oversees day-to-day -day public relations and campaign communications for global professional body, IOSH. Simon is also responsible for managing communications with the organization's award-winning No Time to Lose campaign. So uh, Simon has a long history of uh, working with education and research and communication, and his program, No Time to Lose, has been nominated and has received awards. So uh, Simon, if you would join us, please, uh, with your comments, we would appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, everybody. Um, just changing my view. So it's a great pleasure and uh, privilege to for me to join this this annual uh, event. I'm joining you from England today, um, and we're really proud to collaborate with uh, amazing colleagues and advocates for change, like Linda at ADAO and Mavis Nye in the UK, who I I know you heard from earlier, uh, Linda and Mavis and Ray, her husband, are absolute inspirations. Today in this presentation, focusing on prevention, I'll briefly introduce you to how the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health is tackling occupational cancers caused by asbestos through No Time to Lose, our campaign. Um, in case you're new to IOSH, here's an overview very quickly of who we are, what we do. We're the world's largest membership organization of its kind on, uh, for professional safety, health, and well-being in the workplace with almost uh, 50,000 members in around 130 countries. Um, and we, uh, we advocate, we, sorry. <laughs> we, um, yeah, so along with everything listed here, as a charity and a global NGO, we invest effort, research, intelligence, resources, connections, and expertise on, in preventing harm in the workplace to achieve a healthier, safer world of work for present and future generations. Directing some of this onto diseases caused by asbestos has been an imperative for us for over seven years now. 
Um, so in 2013, we surveyed our members and we consulted senior volunteers working in safety and health across many industries. And we asked for their priorities. Cancers caused by work was very high on their list of concerns. And it was something that wasn't going away. There was little change happening. So we began to create a campaign that would use champions and ambassadors throughout businesses and organizations to raise awareness, educate, and prevent further harm. Uh, the campaign has th um, three sort of main parts to it. Uh, the main point of the campaign is to raise awareness. Uh, Work-based carcinogens are largely under the radar, and we need to raise their profile if we want to, to see more action to control them. Responsible businesses are doing a lot of what is required, but they're a, they're a very small proportion of all of the workplaces and uh, they need to do more. Uh, all workplaces need to do more, all, all environments, work environments. So we, we've developed free resources to help everybody. And finally, we're encouraging organizations to make commitments to prevent carcinogenic exposures at work. Uh, and this is improving policy and practice so whether you're an employer, an employee, an industry body, policymaker, a safety and health professional, occupational hygienist, anyone really, we, we want to call time on work caused cancers. We can beat occupational cancer if we work together to control exposure risks. And through working collaboratively and growing a network of businesses and organizations worldwide, including amazing organizations like ADAO, we reach more people and we provide resources which can help and help people think, help people take the right actions and um, prevent further harm. So we know, we know the figures, but the figures tell only part of the story. When we launched this campaign, there was a, when we were trying to find evidence of the scale of occupational cancer caused by every carcinogen, the estimates at the time was looking at uh, saying around 666,000 people a year, um, now at least 742,000 from the latest um, study, but we, we know that there's more research going on, and really the likelihood is that that figure is, is, a, is a, an underestimate, um, significant underestimate. Half of all work-related deaths in the European Union were due to occupational cancer, uh, cancer caused by work is the biggest killer in China, uh, Western Pacific, Latin America, and asbestos remains the single most lethal carcinogen linked to work. And these figures provide strong data showing the burden of work-caused cancers, but they, they just tell a fraction of the story. We know occupational cancers can and must be prevented. Our members, their job is to ensure that people can work safely, can go home as healthy at the end of the day as they as, as they arrived and uh, uh, this any exposure to any harm at work is something that can and ought to be designed out so we've launched four phases of the no time to lose campaign um, and these are diesel engine exhaust emissions solar radiation silica dust and asbestos but of course, asbestos is the is the largest, uh, is is the, the the biggest and most um, significant of these. And one of the things we established early on is who working in which trades is most at risk. We saw that less well regulated types of work, including self employed traders working in building, property maintenance, plumbing, electrical work, renovations, were many times more likely. Uh, to be exposed to hazards, um, and especially asbestos, harder to reach and to influence. Um, and in countries like the UK, where asbestos has been banned for two decades, and yet at least half a million buildings contain uh, asbestos, people, a new generation who were completely unaware of, of asbestos, people in their late teens, early 20s are going into um, work on, on construction sites or they're going into people's homes or buildings to do work without any sense of some of the hazards that uh, are, 
awaiting them and the fact that asbestos might might be there. Um, and as we know, exposure to asbestos is widespread in society. Uh, and so we, we've, we've sought to find trades, uh, find ways of, of, of getting to people who might not otherwise uh, get our information. And one of the real strengths of this campaign is the linkages through supply chains, the ability for very large organizations who then employ many, many smaller contractors to cascade information through the um, the supply chain and to affect more people and to to raise awareness and, and help people to know what's what they're looking for. Um, in 2018, we as we prepared to launch the campaign, we, we surveyed tradespeople throughout the UK to find out their levels of awareness. You'll see here that um, only three in five um, have the when have the risks regularly reinforced the the information um a third never check asbestos or an asbestos register if they uh, go to a site where there there is asbestos recorded uh, only two thirds of respondents recognize the signs of lung disease caused by asbestos and a quarter say they probably have been exposed to asbestos um a further 40 42 percent a quarter say they have been and a further 42 percent say they may have been so that's that's shocking that's um that's, that's really quite frightening. Um, so in terms of what we do, one of the real areas of focus has been to create free practical materials available online where uh, and, and available to be shared extensively uh, through uh, our, our collaborations and through companies and through um, fellow organizations. Those are made, those are designed to be easy to understand, they're designed to appeal to the broadest audiences and they're in formats available digitally that uh, that can be used in a, a small group situation or for presentations or can be, um, can be reproduced and, and shared and disseminated really easily. And of course, these cover things like simple, what, what is questions, what is asbestos and um, where is it and, uh, um the size of it i think this is probably drawn from uh from uh work that this kind of thing from work that um that linda and others have done with this these 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 um really visual uh cues and um and a series of of kind of pictures that give people a, a sense of where where asbestos lurks and then of course the, the health um risks and what shocked us when we were starting to prepare for this campaign was that uh, in the UK, we've known asbestos is harmful to health since 1895 when and we hold the records for the, the factory inspectors uh, and we've, we've seen that um, they, they were first reporting some of the, some of the effects um, Way back in the in the late nineteenth century, but the but nothing really sort of came to came to people's attention uh, for another thirty or forty years, and then of course there was lots more work um, happening in um, in the US and, and elsewhere ever since then. So you will know this, but here's an example of some of the designs that we've created, and some steps, some simple steps, and ways of managing this, and um, and these are just some of the organizations uh, around the world, including MTR, which uh, uh, is a massive sort of Chinese-based, Hong Kong uh, and Chinese-based um, transport company and large construction companies operating around the world uh, who have signed up to this and are using their networks to share information. Uh, and we've, we're really proud to have partnered with ADAO for, uh, ADAO for uh, several years now. And we're, we're proud that uh, some of our resources are on the NO, the K-N-O-W, a part of the uh, website uh, for ADAO. So hopefully that can be shared even more widely. And here are some good practice case studies that we're also using and another example of the practical materials. So um, please visit this, this URL to find out more, but um, thank you for your time and I'll be around to answer more questions later. 
Thank you, Simon. That was wonderful. Uh, for those that haven't been to their webpage, I would highly suggest going to IOSH. I go there from time to time. The information is really, really helpful, and I do recommend it. Um, our next uh, presenter is uh, Robert or Bob Sussman. Um, now, let's, um, frankly, I don't even know where to begin with, with Bob. His, his career is so storied, but I'll give you some highlights from his bio. Uh, he's a, uh, an attorney, uh, principal with Sussman and Associates, a consulting firm that offers advice on energy and environmental policy issues to clients in the nonprofit and private sectors. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center, was a visiting lecturer at Yale Law School. He served in the Obama administration, uh, working with the EPA and a senior policy counsel and the EPA administrator from 2009 to 2013. Served in the Clinton administration as the EPA deputy administrator between 1993 and 94. Um, and then uh, Bob has uh, continued to work with um, uh, various groups like environmental science, National Academy of Sciences, a commissioner, interstate commission for the Potomac River Basin. He's a magnum cum laude graduate of Yale. Very congratulations to you. And 73, he graduated from Yale Law School. And he works very closely posting blogs in the Brookings Institute's webpage. I wish I could read it all, but please, folks, let's welcome uh, Bob Sussman. And I look forward to your words, sir. Uh, great. Thanks a lot, Tom. It's, uh, it's great to be here. So um, uh, this is, I believe, my, my third of the annual ADAO conferences and uh, they're, they're always great events and, and I, I leave them uh, feeling inspired and, and motivated and, and also uh, heartened that there is uh, such a strong community uh, of experts and, and victims and, and policymakers and scientists who uh, uh, are, are working to, uh, to prevent uh, asbestos-related uh, related disease. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and thank Linda uh, in particular for her stalwart work uh, organizing this conference, um, I I want to uh, focus on uh, asbestos on the front lines in uh, in in Washington D.C. and um, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, asbestos is front and center these days in Congress. Uh, at EPA and uh, and in the courts, and I think that the level of activity uh, here in DC is the highest that we've seen since the regulatory surge on asbestos in in the 1980s. Um, there is uh, uh, a three pronged focus that I see as I look at the ongoing activity. Uh, the first is uh, banning asbestos legislatively, which you've heard a lot about today. Uh, the second is uh, uh, EPA's uh, ongoing efforts to evaluate the risks of asbestos and, uh, and then manage those risks under under Tosca, and then a third stream of activity is in the courts, and uh, the cases uh, have, I think, had as their mission uh, forcing EPA uh, to do its job on uh, on asbestos and and holding the agency uh, accountable. So. ADAO has been right in the thick of this. Uh, ADAO has been uh, a powerful uh, advocate and, and voice for public health uh, before EPA. Um, ADAO has, has of course, uh, uh, been the leading advocate for an asbestos ban in Congress and uh, ADAO is also a litigant in, in a number of, of cases against 
uh, EPA. And I think on all fronts, uh, we've won some important battles, uh, but the work is not done. Uh, there is uh, much more to do. So let me uh, hang on just a second. So um, let me let me start with with Congress. Uh, I know you've you've heard a lot about this today, uh, uh, and I may be repeating uh, what Linda and others have said, uh, but. I think as we look at congressional activity on asbestos uh, uh, in the last session of Congress, the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act uh, made more progress than it had ever made before. Uh, uh, the high water mark was a 47 to one uh, bipartisan vote in the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, on uh, November 29, 2019, uh, to send our ban uh, to the floor of the House of Representatives uh, for, for a vote. And uh, that was uh, uh, a wonderful, a wonderful moment because uh, uh, there was solid bipartisan uh, consensus on the need for uh, an asbestos ban. And, and that consensus was uh, not only uh, the result of advocacy by Linda and uh, many others who are participating in uh, this conference, but uh, it, was, it was also uh, the work of uh, uh, behind the scenes uh, efforts uh, by uh, leading Democrats and, and Republicans who found a way to reach across the aisle and, and achieve compromises and, and focus on uh, the larger goal uh, and, and not necessarily uh, partisan conflict or uh, continued debate about the details. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that uh, positive mood and uh, uh, strong bipartisan uh, cooperation uh, 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 did not survive uh, on the House floor. And um, the, the asbestos legislation was, uh, was brought to the floor for a vote, but uh, unfortunately it failed. Um, but here we are in 2021 and uh, we, we have new life for asbestos ban legislation. Uh, uh, we have in, in the Senate uh, uh, two members who have stepped up and shown real leadership, Senator Berkeley, uh, Democrat, and uh, Senator Daines. Uh, you've, you've heard about the Berkeley discussion draft, which has been released. Uh, this is not yet a bill, uh, so it's a bit of a work in progress, uh, but it's a very strong start. Uh, and the discussion draft plus uh, the continuing strong support that we're getting from stakeholders put us in, in a very good position. So um, you've, you've, you, you've heard this before today as well, but it's, but it's worth underscoring. Um, what are we trying to accomplish in, in legislation? And there are four uh, pillars of the legislation uh, the first is to ban uh, commercial importation and use of all six recognized asbestos fibers, plus Libby Amphibol, Winshite, and Richterite uh, within one year of enactment. And think about what a ban in, in one year means. Uh, 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 a ban in one year would be truly uh, transformative. 
Um, the second goal is is to address the uh, the largest asbestos using uh, industrial sector in the United States, which is uh, the chloralkali uh, industry. And um, I think all of us want to see uh, an end to the use of asbestos uh, by this industry. Uh, uh, the legislation uh, that, that we saw in the last Congress and, and now the discussion draft uh, would do that. Uh, the industry would transition out of asbestos uh, to non-asbestos technology uh, within eight years. And that would be a very significant accomplishment. Uh, the third uh, is, is uh, to bring to bear the latest science and data uh, on the risks of legacy asbestos, uh, which as you've heard is present in millions of residences, businesses, factories, public buildings and schools, uh, and to engage uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, as, as the repository for uh, our country's best uh, scientific expertise and experience uh, to assess the ongoing risks of legacy asbestos and give us some guidance on where we need to go. And then uh, the final goal in, involves information reporting. And, and here the objective is uh, to give us confidence that uh, we, in fact, know uh, who is importing, processing, uh, and distributing raw asbestos and asbestos-containing products, uh, how much asbestos is uh, involved, where is the asbestos uh, located, and how is it used, and uh, who, is, who is exposed. And, this is, this is important information to have in hand uh, before we move ahead with, with the ban, because uh, we need to know uh, who, is, who is using asbestos now so that we can be absolutely sure uh, that a ban, when it comes, uh, is effective. So let me, uh, let me turn to EPA and uh, what EPA is doing, and then uh, why EPA is not doing enough. So in 2016, uh, Congress amended the, uh, the Toxic Substances Control Act, and uh, the amendment of TSCA opened up uh, a whole new uh, sphere of regulatory activity on on asbestos, and you'll you'll all remember that EPA uh, tried to ban asbestos in 1989 under TSCA, uh, but the courts uh, rejected the ban. Uh, and what happened um, in the last several years as Congress looked at amending TSCA is asbestos emerged as a a poster child for the, uh, the failures of, of TSCA legislation. Uh, and that naturally led EPA and advocates, and members of Congress in the White House uh, to say, okay, um, now that we have a new statute, uh, asbestos should be at the top of the list. Uh, EPA should be moving ahead uh, to do the work on asbestos that it tried to do in 1989. Uh, but failed to get done. So um, what has EPA done uh, since 20, 2016? Uh, here's, here's the report card. Uh, first, they have completed uh, what they call a part one uh, asbestos risk evaluation for current asbestos uses. Uh, they have determined that those uses uh, including chloroalkali, by the way, and brake linings uh, present an unreasonable risk of injury. Uh, they have begun a risk management process uh, to address these risks 
and reduce them. And finally, uh, they have announced that they are doing a part two evaluation, uh, which will be addressing uh, legacy asbestos exposure. So uh, EPA has made some progress and there has been some forward movement, but there's also been, I think, a lot of disappointment uh, in what EPA has done, uh, uh, particularly uh, on the watch of the Trump administration. Um, and and uh, I, I wanted to, to highlight for you some of the, uh, the things that, that we and many others have been disappointed by. Uh, the first is that, that EPA uh, did not require uh, mandatory reporting on current asbestos use and exposure. And the outcome of that was that EPA uh, had very poor and incomplete information for its risk evaluation. Uh, the part one risk evaluation uh, was very narrow and uh, incomplete. It was limited uh, to chrysotile. Uh, asbestos fibers. Um, it did not address the other fiber types. Uh, it also did not address all of the endpoints, the health endpoints uh, that are associated with asbestos. Uh, uh, for example, uh, it did not uh, address the non-cancer uh, health endpoints, and it did not address uh, all of the types of cancer that have been uh, linked to asbestos. Uh, it overlooked uh, roots of exposure to asbestos, uh, and it did not address uh, asbestos contamination of talc. So the evaluation was uh, peer-reviewed uh, and was severely criticized by EPA's independent Science Advisory Committee on Chemicals. Um, another area of deep. Bob, I'm sorry, but you were, we're going to have to kind of get move us along because we got other speakers that got to come up. Okay. Next. Okay. Well, let me uh, let me just simply say that the jury is out on whether uh, EPA will use its authority to ban uh, asbestos, and and I. I, I want to close by uh, uh, reiterating that notwithstanding what EPA is doing under TOSCA, uh, an asbestos ban is absolutely critical and essential. Uh, the ban will lock in a comprehensive uh, prohibition on asbestos uh, that cannot be challenged in the courts uh, and will produce immediate results. So thank you. So our next speaker is Mark Catlin. He's the former Occupational Health and Safety Director, retired at this point for the uh, Service Employees International Union, or what we call SEIU, representing 2 million healthcare service and public workers in the United States and Canada. He's an industrial hygienist and health and safety activist since 1991, and he's been involved with asbestos issues his entire career. Uh, Mark has a wonderful career, uh, one of the most knowledgeable people I know on the asbestos issue. And sir, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to start your comments for us and we look forward to it. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for that, for that introduction. It's really good to be here at this year's conference. We really missed not having the conference last year. And uh, I'm also really honored to be able to participate in ADO's prevention advisory board and, and try to support the work of ADAO, this good work. Um, as Tom mentioned, I've, I've worked as an industrial hygienist and I'm still, I'm semi-retired now, still working, but uh, for more than 40 years, I, I've been doing this work. And when I started, asbestos was one of the major issues that I ended up working on. I was working with industrial manufacturing plant workers um, at a union, and, and this was a major issue that we had. Um, and even though I've often moved on to focus on other exposure issues and other hazards with other workers, asbestos always keeps coming back. 
And, you know, and it's been frustrating to think that we, we thought we got rid of it by the late 80s, early 90s as an issue, and it keeps coming back. And so, and, and just more recently, I've been doing in this last 18 months, mostly work around COVID-19 and protecting workers in schools and, and other, other settings. And what we've been running into more recently is that Congress had appropriated hundreds of billions of dollars to schools to do mitigation for uh, COVID protection of students and staff. And a lot of that is focused on ventilation systems and buildings. And the issue of the legacy asbestos that still remains is, is often unaddressed when this asbestos is being disturbed to protect people from COVID. So we have this legacy problem that keeps showing back up again. So I really appreciate and, and, and so appreciate the work of Linda and all the, uh, all the ADO volunteers and supporters because this work is so important and I'd love to see this go away as a major issue before I end my time on the planet. I thought it would be done by the time I retired. That hasn't happened. Um, and as Tom mentioned, I, I've, I've worked most of my career uh, working as a health and safety professional with uh, labor unions and their members and, and dealing with a variety of hazards, including asbestos. And the, you know, the tragedies that, that Rebecca mentioned and that Kelly mentioned with AFT, you know, I could repeat those same stories during my time with SEIU. We have lots of members in schools. We have members who clean buildings and maintain buildings. And so there's lots of potential for exposure. Many of our members are told by their employers, if they ask, that asbestos has been banned, as if that takes care of their problem. Or they'll be told, oh, it's a, it was all removed from the buildings many years ago. There's no problem. And our members are often very angry, very upset when they find out that this, uh, that this was not true. And so this, you know, the work of ADAO is so important, both on the ban, uh, which is critical to finish that work, but also on the education to try to prevent these exposures to the legacy asbestos. SEIU was a leader in, was one of the leaders in, in trying to control asbestos back in the 1980s with AFT and lots of other unions were part of that. Um, you know, and we won those key victories that, that Kelly mentioned, but we didn't win them all. And you know, the, the ban was the major one that we lost on. And after that, we, we in, to a great extent, many of us in safety and health moved on to other issues because they came up and we kind of hoped that the asbestos issue would be, uh, would be dealt with by the existing laws and regulations. Well, unfortunately, many of the agencies, EPA, OSHA, state agencies that had authority over asbestos also seemed to move on. And I recall by the late 90s hearing from, uh, hearing from many of these regulatory agencies that, oh, there's training requirements and certification, and we don't have to worry about asbestos anymore. But a lot of us, you know, saw that this was really not true, and that things seemed to be getting worse. And uh, and so that's where we are today. Um, the I wanted to give a give a, a short since we've been telling wonderful stories here. Of a, I want to remember my friend Dan Middall. Dan was a construction insulator who started in the 1970s. He was a member of the Asbestos Workers Union Local 97 in Anchorage, Alaska, and that's where I met Dan and worked with Dan. He was an early act activist for the control of asbestos exposure because of his early exposures, and he had, asbest he had early stages of asbestosis as a fairly young man. In the 1970s, uh, when Dan moved to Alaska to work because of the Alaska pipeline and other reasons, uh, uh, there was a lot of asbestos being installed in, uh, throughout facilities in Alaska. Alaska, it turns out, was a dumping ground for many of the major manufacturers because they couldn't sell products to more knowledgeable uh, 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 organizations in the lower 48 who were starting to see the coming ban on, us, on some asbestos products, but they were sold in Alaska. And so he used to joke that he spent the first half of his insulator career uh, installing asbestos products and that he would spend the second half of his insulator career removing them. Uh, but he was he was an early uh, he was an early worker in terms of developing and 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 learning about asbestos abatement techniques and respiratory protection and other and other parts of that trade. He was an early teacher in his union and in, in the state of Alaska on both the dangers of asbestos and how to do abatement properly to to both apprentice, apprentices and and journeyman insulators. And I learned a lot about this work from him in my in my early days as a young hygienist. Uh, unfortunately, Dan died from asbestos-related uh, diseases uh, a, a little more than a decade ago, 
just before I attended my first conference uh, with ADAO. And so I, I, I connect Dan's legacy and Dan's life with, with ongoing with ADAO's work. And so thank you so much again. Um, during the 1990s, a lot of my work around asbestos focused on training and education of both union and non-union construction workers uh, and many trades who are required by the laws and regulations we had won in the 1980s uh, to be trained and certified to remove this, especially abatement workers. And you know, we were hoping that this would be the action that would really help out. Um, so in the course of doing a lot of that and, and doing a lot of that training and, and also starting to run into abatement workers who are now attending their 10th or 12th asbestos training refresher course, I, I started looking for ways to liven up and, and highlight some of the issues that seem to be dying out. And so um, what I discovered then was, was uh, increasingly available uh, historical films about from asbestos producers. Johns Mansfield made films highlighting their products in the 20s and in the 40s and in the 60s. Other manufacturers also put out promo films about this. And then in the 60s and 70s, there started to be films from, from unions and government and organizations trying to highlight the hazards of asbestos that, were, that had been uncovered and how to deal with that asbestos. So there's this actually extensive history of, of, of film and video that talk about the work that, that ADAO is now leading. And so um, I used those in training and they were, very, uh, they were very useful. In 2006, when YouTube showed up, I started a, um, a channel of historical films and I would, and this is the URL, hopefully you can see that. And um, I want to encourage people to take a look at this site and to look at the asbestos films and use these because I think they become very helpful so that we don't forget that these manufacturers knew of these hazards, that they expanded the use of these products in, a, in an amazing way over many decades. And that we as, and that the government has also known about these dangers for a long time and has been slow to finally deal with it. So we wanna keep this history alive and not let it forget. I've also found that these films are very useful in, uh, uh, they're, they're useful in campaigns against uh, asbestos exposures. And so they can be useful And ADAO has used some of these historical films. Uh, they've been also useful in some litigation where attorneys have wanted to use the films to, to show what exposures used to be like. Because when you're trying to describe worker exposure 40 years ago, you might need to show the judge and the jury this sort of, these sort of examples. And so that was an unexpected use of the films. But mostly the films have been used to educate physicians and public health students and workers and others about the hazards of asbestos. And so I would urge people to take a look at the site, take a look at the films, and, and to sort of see how these can be useful in the work of a both in the work on asbestos control and to further the aims of ADAO. Um, there's some new films that are coming up that are, that are, that are recently uncovered that, um, that, uh, that focus on Dr. Irving Silikoff from Mount Sinai and his early work in the 60s and 70s. And, and it's some amazing footage of him talking about the dangers of asbestos all the way back then. So take a look at the channel, uh, keep up the great work of ADAO, uh, support the, the Alan Rangstein ban, on asbestos and write the letters from the AFL-CIO campaign and will help move this work forward. Thank you so much, Linda and everybody else. I'm happy to be here and I'll throw it back to Tom. Thank you, Mark. If you guys haven't found his pages, he's got a Facebook page too uh, that you can get some of these videos. Um, as a someone that was in the training room for 35 years, uh, I found a lot of these things too, but I started using his webpage and sending it to all kinds of people around the world that needed those uh, pieces of information. Some of the historical films he has are just wonderful. So thank you very much, Mark, for all of that. All right, our next speaker almost needs no introduction. Uh, his name is Tony Rich. I've known Tony for a very long time. Uh, Tony, like myself and Brent Kynock and other people that are part of this uh, uh, conference, uh, we do work in the asbestos control industry. We're the folks that do asbestos inspections and monitor asbestos removal projects. We're the guys dealing with the legacy issues. And Tony is certainly an expert. He works as an industrial hygienist as well as a uh, environmental technician. But most importantly about Tony is his, his ability to collect things 
regarding asbestos, the photographs that he takes of it. And if you guys haven't seen his webpage on Flickr called Asbestorama, you need to. It's probably one of the biggest collections, the finest collections of pictures of asbestos, asbestos products, historical things that probably exist in the world. And he's got millions of hits on his webpage. So uh, Tony, please help us. And uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say today. Thanks, Tom. And uh, I'd also, <clears throat> thank you. I'd also like to thank Linda and, and ADO for inviting me uh, to speak today during the 16th annual uh, Asbestos Awareness and Prevention virtual conference. Really, really do miss uh, being in person, seeing all my great colleagues and meeting new friends. But ADAO is truly an amazing organization with so many wonderful people <clears throat> sharing their incredible stories, vast knowledge and uh, expertise, all with the mutual goal of helping to make our world safer from the toxic threat of asbestos. As an industrial hygienist working in an environmental consulting uh, control, asbestos control uh, industry field over the last 28 years, I've tended to specialize um, as an asbestos professional, uh, particularly with uh, project monitoring, like Tom said, and inspections. Um, government regulations uh, were set up so that individuals could be trained and properly licensed and accredited to do these activities to find the asbestos and remove it safely. Uh, during that time, I've collected, as Tom mentioned, a lot of photos, many photos of various conditions of asbestos uh, containing materials and even a few products uh, along the way. Um, and I've shared a lot of these images through ADAO asbestos uh, prevention campaigns and also in exhibits at ADAO conferences, which um, I believe is met with some, uh, some interest. Um, these photos and products all demonstrate uh, all too well how much asbestos really was and still is a major problem in our daily lives. Asbestos awareness saves lives. But what is asbestos? What is it? Um, there's, there's a very basic uh, terminology that asbestos is a group of fibrous minerals used uh, as an ingredient in many thousands of products and applications. Uh, the common number that's thrown out there is 3,000 products. But behind me, I have catalogs from several asbestos manufacturers, they each alone have several hundred of products in their own catalogs. All combined, that's well over 3,000. I'd have to say it's 10 to 15,000 products, different applications, materials. It, it's just, it seems to me like overwhelming when I first got into this business and, and started finding this had asbestos, that has asbestos. It, it just didn't end. <clears throat> but it it really starts out, um, as many of us may or may not know, as a uh, as a, a mining product. I have some photos to share. This was a mine. I, I think even uh, Linda was there uh, at one point. We had a tour, but um, Canada has since stopped mining, uh, I believe, in 2012. So that's a good thing. But this is how as best as starts. Uh, large machines, large open pit. Use, usually uh, sometimes underground. Um, if it's scrolling properly, you should see another mine. This is in Vermont. Oh, good. And um, good. you also see mill buildings and a very, very, very large pile of asbestos waste, which is still there. Um, so that's how asbestos starts. These large mining operations, this, this is an asbestos uh, Quebec a town that was was named after the, the mineral. And since this photo, it's actually been flooded, but that's how asbestos starts. And that's a close-up picture of a, a section of the, uh, the raw mineral. Um, you can see it's a fibrous um, type of material right from the rock. Uh, this particular type is chrysotile. Uh, this, this was self-collected while I was in, 
in Canada. Um, so you can see the seam that, that runs across the, the rock, it goes to the mill, they crush it, they separate it. This is a uh, uh, or piece of uh, chrysidolite, which is actually that color, it's blue. Uh, this particular sample is from Bolivia, which is a light, kind of a light, lighter shade of blue. Um, goes to the mine, they take it to the mill, they crush it, bag it, and you can see here is at the time they were still processing uh, in the mill, and it 50 kilogram bags goes to the manufacturer and they uh, incorporate it into <clears throat> all those materials we were talking about. And why they used it, it uh, asbestos was found to be a great insulator and also added a lot of durability and strength to products among several other characteristics. So you can imagine adding millions of tiny uh, fibers to a material like cement uh, and uh, what I kind of liken that to is like microscopic rebar, you know, adding it to a material and it, it increases the strength of that. Um, so we have material like asbestos added to cement, which brings us to the uh, next photo. Can't seem to, there we go, sorry. More uh, asbestos palletized, ready to go out to those uh, manufacturing facilities. And this is what we have a close up of asbestos cement with uh, white and blue asbestos, chrysotile and chrysidolite mixed in in that material. Um, these materials degrade, deteriorate over time and the fibers are liberated, uh, can become airborne and we have uh, potential for exposures. And this is the, uh, the, the macro view of that that material, uh, you can see it's a pipe structure. Uh, in this case, it was used as a vent duct. Um, Johns Manville actually created the term transite, which is what how we refer to most asbestos cement in the in the U.S. It's also also used as many countries, many folks may know or recognize the corrugated sheets. This is a large wall at a industrial facility. Uh, asbestos cement uh, also used on roofing. But asbestos can be found in many places, um, from homes to high rises and practically everywhere in between. Uh, to locate asbestos, the, I mentioned earlier, US regulations have established requirements for building owners to inspect for asbestos containing materials through a concept called due diligence. And they have to be conducted by properly trained and accredited asbestos inspectors, such as myself, Tom, within their respective state. But as an asbestos inspector, it is our task to ask, where is it? Is it in the ceilings? Is it in the walls? Is it in the floors? Behind, above, below, any of these areas? On the exterior of the building or on interior building systems? And some of the more common materials, I mean, the list goes on, um, or what I call the usual suspects are like floor tile, what you see here. Uh, in this case, it's in great condition. This is at a school, uh, properly maintained, properly waxed and sealed. So this, I believe, was installed in the 50s. So this is decades old, but looks like it's almost freshly installed. So you can maintain asbestos, but in many cases, it can be improperly handled or deteriorated over time. Um, so we have floor tile. Here's a situation where the floor tile was not properly maintained and it's damaged, uh, creating potential exposure hazards. Uh, here, a renovation taking place where they were pulling up the carpet, floor tile underneath, damaged. Um, and that's where we get involved and uh, you need special asbestos control personnel to come in and properly remove it. Here's a close-up of that tile. You can see this is a magnified view along the broken edge, but the asbestos fibers are clearly visible. Um, of course, what the real hazards are is the invisible microscopic fibers you can't see that could be breathed in. Uh, this is a very common material lately that I've been running into. Um, uh, 
drywall joint compound run into a situation where contractors come in due to extreme weather events that have affected buildings like floods or sewage backups that come in. And these contractors will, uh, without any regard, just start removing materials. And we get called in, take samples, comes back with asbestos. Uh, now we have a larger, much larger contamination issue and potential exposures for more people. Uh, situation, just as I described, contractor just started doing work in a big mess in this apartment. This just from a small uh, potential leak where the water uh, affected the drywall and it was wet. And they just started cutting it out without testing first. Uh, another so picture. Pick, pick, pick a couple of good pictures here because we got to move into our keynote speaker here soon. Okay. Uh, we have plaster with horse hair, animal hair, and uh, asbestos, pipe insulation. Many, many homes may have this. It looks like corrugated cardboard. Uh, it can be damaged, creating a very uh, serious situation for exposure. It can have brown paper, black paper. Uh, this is a, a very powdery material. It's referred to as magnesia. Uh, this was in a school where the personnel uh, accidentally damaged it, causing potential exposures. Uh, zonalite attic insulation. Uh, the Libby mine there had as, asbestos contaminated vermiculite. Uh, clearly, that's the product with the bag. Um, if you see this in your home, uh, you really want to hire uh, an asbestos professional to handle testing and removal. This is an air sample of minimal, expo minimal disturbance of that vermiculite, seeing a lot of microscopic airborne amphibole fibers in that uh, PCM sample. Another picture. Uh, sometimes it's covered over with cellulose or fiberglass. Be careful. Um, again, we want to hire an asbestos uh, professional to test for that. In residential sit, uh, environments, you also can run into duct insulation, like a paper on the, the metal duct. Again, like a, a thick metal or a thick paper here. Um, but that's just to name a few. First thing you need to do if you suspect asbestos is to hire a qualified asbestos professional to inspect and test. But what can be done if asbestos is, is found? Again, hire a qualified licensed asbestos professional to have the asbestos properly and safely removed and disposed. I also highly encourage to visit ADO.org for additional information about asbestos. It's an excellent, excellent resource. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Please folks do see his webpage on Flickr called Asbestorama. It is very helpful to help you understand the nature of asbestos materials. I want to say thank you to Tom. What a great moderator. You know all the backstories and to Mark, Tony, Simon, and obviously Kelly, and of course, Bob. Uh, Tony, we're going to relaunch the See For Yourself with your amazing pictures. And yes, we should profile your videos again, Mark, because they're fabulous. And of course, Tom, you remain such a treasure to me with your information. And we'll put out prevention because that is where we need to go. 